Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and I wanted to start today's adventure right here around this beautiful planet in this very beautiful system. You can see there's a star of some sort and you can see that there is some sort of a terrestrial planet. This is probably what's really happening in the system we're talking about today. The thing is, something was observed very recently there and that's something, well, there's a way for us to demonstrate this. So imagine you're standing somewhere on this planet and suddenly, out of nowhere, you see this. The entire sky start to light up really, really bright. For about 10 to possibly 15 minutes, the actual heat of the star becomes unbearable. It went from being about 2000 degrees Kelvin to about 9 to 10,000. This is what we would call a super flare. And the amount of radiation that was created by such a super flare is actually absolutely ridiculous. Now, one of the more powerful uh, flare events that happened here on planet Earth in the historical times when we could actually record this was in 1859, um, and this is known as the Carrington event. This was the event that um, even before global communication system, before the electronics, created a lot of problems for even things like telegrams. That event was so powerful that it burned cables and also set telegram paper on fire. Now, this is something that we expect will happen one day, uh, specifically, there's actually one event that was about to happen, but luckily Earth missed it by a little bit. Back in 2012, there was a powerful flare that we were able to avoid. But imagine this happening to a smaller star, specifically this star right here, known as ULAS J2249. If you were to come to the surface or closer to the surface of the star, you'd realize that it's actually not very massive and not very big. It's what's known as an L-type star. It's essentially barely even a star. It's kind of like a brown dwarf that got some extra mass and was able to initiate nuclear reaction on the inside. In other words, it's kind of like a brown dwarf turned red dwarf, but not really. So we're not entirely even sure how to classify these stars, but they are very, very interesting. And because this object is not very massive at all, it's um, over 10 times less massive than the sun and way, way smaller too, you don't really expect them to be that powerful, but the thing is, they are. Most red dwarfs and most brown dwarfs are extremely powerful when it comes to flares. Now, first of all, let's uh, take a look at uh, some objects you might be familiar with, just so we can actually see how uh, all of this looks. So here's Jupiter compared to our sun would look like this. It's a much, much smaller planet than our sun. But if we were to give Jupiter, um, let's just say about 80 to 90 times more mass, it would actually turn into a small star. And this is a typical red dwarf. Now, there's a balance we can find here where it's going to turn into something similar to the L-type dwarf you just saw. And although in terms of the uh, size, it's only a little bit larger than Jupiter. In terms of mass, it's significantly larger. And this suggests that the density on the inside is much higher. And it also suggests that because this object spins and probably spins really fast, it's going to start creating quite a lot of magnetic field. And um, eventually this will create what's known as magnetic entanglement. So if you were to look at a single magnetic field line inside our sun, this is what you would see. There is a magnetic field that comes out of this region, goes inside another region, and it forms this loop that you um, can usually see through the sunspots. The sunspots are actually kind of slightly cooler than the region around them because they don't allow the um, hot gas to get into this area. And so um, usually the more sunspots you see, the more magnetic field lines there are. And for our own sun, it sort of looks something similar to this. Eventually, um, because these lines are pretty much everywhere, they can start entangling and mixing together. And eventually, due to the rotation of the sun and due to the, the actual number of lines here, um, they usually just kind of snap. And as they snap, they release a tremendous amount of energy. This crazy amount of energy is what we would call a solar flare. And once in a while, it might actually hit Earth or some other planet. But um, for our sun, because it's a relatively calm star when it comes to the actual solar flares, we don't get to see anything uh, major very often. The Carrington event was um, a relatively rare event, and usually these events might happen every 200 years or so. 
But for L-type dwarf, which is much smaller than the sun and spins relatively fast, it has a lot of a lot of magnetic field lines. It also has quite a lot of opportunities for these lines to get entangled, and as they do so and as they snap, they obviously start flaring up a lot. Here, if I accelerate time a little bit, you'll see that there's going to be quite a, a lot of flares. Like there was one just now, there's another one, and this is only like every day or so. So these objects, they do flare up and their flares are ridiculously powerful. And because of this, it's kind of like having an object, a star, that suddenly increases in intensity, in radiation, in temperature for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes every once in a while. And this can obviously cause a detrimental effect to any planet. So let's maybe take a look at another planet here. These are all procedurally generated, so they probably don't exist in real life. Or if they do, they probably don't look like this at all. But here, imagine that you are some sort of a creature trying to survive right here on the surface of this planet that seems to have liquid water. Or at least liquid something, I don't actually know if it's water. And um, you are located at the so-called bright side of this planet, and because these are usually um, tidally locked, the same face will always be pointing the star. In other words, you don't really get to experience nighttime here, because this is what usually happens around red dwarfs. There is that star in the middle, and then once in a while, possibly every day or at least every week, you get to see this. It goes up in brightness, and then after about half an hour, it goes back to normal. And this increases the radiation dramatically. And obviously, for any organism trying to survive here, if there is any, this would pose quite a challenge. How do you survive these ridiculously powerful and deadly flares? So, um, there's actually some papers out there that speculate about this. If there is life here, how does it survive? Maybe, just maybe, this life actually depends on these flares for survival. Maybe um, it only acquires energy when these uh, flares happen and uh, pretty much just sleeps or stays dormant for the rest of the time. So, definitely a very interesting topic, but just the fact that we're able to observe a super flare, essentially, a flare that's 10 times more powerful than anything coming from our own sun, and all of this coming from this tiny little object right there in the middle of this star system that's not even remotely as large or as massive as our own sun makes it quite impressive. And here's, by the way, what would happen if you were to uh, place our sun next to it. So, because of the mass of our sun, this tiny Jupiter object will probably um, go into orbit around our sun and stay there as a typical planet. So this is how much smaller and less massive these objects are. Well, anyway, so on that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Studies like this um, will definitely help us in the future to figure out what's really happening around planets like this, Proxima b, which is the closest exoplanet to us in the habitable zone of a red dwarf. And so understanding what happens during those flares and how these flares can be survived and avoided is really important for us. But for now though, I guess all we know is that this is definitely, or was definitely, the brightest flare we've observed so far. So maybe in the future we'll see something even brighter, but that's probably not a good sign. On that note, thank you so much for watching, I'll see you guys tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon. Space out, and as always, bye bye.